Thanks, Chris. All right. Hopefully I didn't try to sing too loud and blow my voice. Double duty. Double duty. You know, at least I didn't give the communion and the contribution. All of it. All of it. You know. Then it'd be the church of me. <laughs> All right. You are a pope. <laughs> <laughs> True. All right. Um, good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure and my sometimes fear <laughs> to speak to you today. Um, but, you know... It really helps me to think, prepare, mm. you know, and I always like to use this, the, the uh, quote that those who preach to others preach first to themselves mm -hmm. because, you know, I, in order to tell you and preach at you or to you, I better be solid on it, right? Because yeah. it's really hard to convey a message with heart when it's not hitting you. I can come up here and do the motions and, you know, say what maybe needs to be said. Um, but I pray that God uh, will communicate through me because this is, this is a challenging topic for me. Um, we're going to talk about true connection today. And uh, in order to give due credit, I have borrowed some content from an article by a brother named Andrew Kitchen. He's a... Uh, his website, at least, is in uh, Australia, so that's where I believe he lives. Um, but I like reading some of his stuff. He writes these articles and, and puts them on his uh, website. So um, I got to share some of the stuff um, about worship, what the true meaning of worship is some time ago. Um, so this time we're going to talk about true connection. And I had a question for you. You know, first, have you ever dialed up a family member or a friend on your phone and uh, gotten a really bad connection mm -hmm. where you couldn't really even understand what they were saying? Yeah. Or uh, have you ever tried dialing somebody and you couldn't even get through because you had no signal? Of course. How did it make you feel? Did you feel disappointed? Probably depends on who you're calling. <laughs> if it was the insurance company and you're trying to get them to pay for your uh, medical bill, and they're not uh, getting through, that's frustrating and discouraging. Uh, did you feel angry or upset? Did you feel annoyed? <laughs> at, so, at some point in time or another, we probably felt all of these things uh, when we couldn't get through to somebody. Um, you know, it's kind of like that in life and in our relationships in life as well. Um, so that's what we'll be looking at today. But today we'll be talking about connection and what that looks like through the lens of the Bible. It's one thing to be on the phone and uh, another thing entirely uh, when we talk about relationships. Um, Think about what it would be like to be completely connected with God, with your spouse, with your kids, uh, with your wider family and friends. Um, we would definitely know with certainty how we fit kind of into the fabric of those people around us. You'd feel totally loved, totally secure, mm -hmm. uh, totally certain about the point of life, really. So first of all, I'm going to talk about connecting with one another. You know, in this whole issue with connection, though, the problem is many of us stink at connection. <laughs> you know, uh, awkwardness. Ever felt these? Uncertainty, self-absorption. Um, you know, these all get in the way. And what's, you know, what's the motivation anyway? You know, it takes a lot of effort 
to connect with people and our efforts may not always be well received. Um, for, you know, some of us, connection may simply be, you know, outside of our experience in our lives so far. Um, sorry. My uh, tablet decided to scroll on me. <laughs> um, sorry. For some of us, you know, connection may simply be outside of our lived experience. You know, we experience disconnection, uh, violence, dysfunction. They have meant that those may have been the norm for some of us, you know, growing up. Um, so, yeah, there are many barriers. Isn't, it, isn't connection something we all desire? Mm -hmm. Something we all crave? Yeah. You know, we may not say it aloud. Um, but the desire to feel connection is inside all of us. It is a universal need. It's what it means to be human. You know, deep longing inside of us. You know, but as we look into that well, many of us see it's far from full. <laughs> and we have no idea where the bucket is. Um, Paul's letter to the Ephesians is written to a church in which members were struggling to properly connect with one another. Uh, there were two groups in the church, as you could probably guess. They were the Jews, and they were the Gentiles. They were the, the in-crowd, so to speak, and the Absolutely. newcomers, you know, the, uh, the excluded, the formerly excluded. They came from very different religious and cultural backgrounds. Um, you know, old ways of thinking and cultures dies hard. You know, even though they were now in the same church, in Christ's church. Um, so much so that, you know, it could be said that this was the number one problem, not just in Ephesus, but in the first century church as a whole. Yet, you know, God had done his part. And, you know, just kind of paraphrasing from Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, you can go look it up later. Um, Paul's saying, come on, guys, think about it. How many bodies are there? One. How many spirits are there? One. Lords, faiths, baptisms. One. So, are you guys getting it? How many groups should there be in your church then? Multiple choice. <laughs> One or two or many. Some churches, it's many. But for Ephesians, they needed to know it was one. Mm. They needed to connect with God and with each other. So right now you might be saying, okay, so, so much for the theory lesson or the scholarly lesson. What? How's that actually work? Um, turn to Ephesians 1, verse 18. And some of this may be obvious. Some of it may be stuff you've read before. I'm hoping this will just remind us and put a seed in our hearts and our minds to really pursue some of this stuff. In Ephesians 1, 18 through 19, it says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people 
to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. You know, in other words, the number one New Testament problem is to be met with the number one New Testament solution, which is love, which has always been. You know, the starting point for them, then, was to be established in love. So, who here is a gardener? <laughs> Anyone? No gardeners? We could put the green thumb or <laughs> likes to get their fingernails dirty. Jim? <laughs> you know, what's it take at the beginning of planting season to get your plants uh, established and rooted? Uh, you know, breaking up some rocky ground, maybe. Uh, maybe some soil amendment, something to, to help break it up, get it better, back into a better uh, state for growing. Um, some digging is going to be required uh, to get things going. You know, this is <laughs> uh, deliberate, you know, spiritual gardening as well. To get rooted and established in love. Paul's number one prayer for them uh, was for them to come to an understanding of just how massively, all right, science guys, cubic Christ's love for them is. You get the width and the height and the depth. That's a cubic equation. Okay. All right, for you non-math folks. <laughs> That'd be a large volume that's undescribably large. To really know it, even though the extent is actually unknowable. <coughs> um, why? So that they can be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now that kind of feeling sounds like you don't have to bend all that far down. Talked about the well not being full. Uh, you don't have to go down very far to drink from that well. And so when you have resources like this to draw from, cross-cultural unity, um, doesn't seem like such a big problem anymore. Uh, the same could be said with people maybe that you don't, you know, not associate with, identify with. People that you don't have anything in common with. It's the same solution. Um, it's the same solution. Uh, is to have love for one another. To be filled with that love that, that Christ gave us. So connection, you know, the thing that we all crave, it doesn't happen by accident. You know, we must be individually deliberate, unde you know, uh, determined, mm -hmm. intentional. You know, it could be as simple as setting up coffee, yeah. having some time alone with somebody to get to know them. And it's basically spending time Spending time to connect. There's no, there's no substitute for time. We know this, you know. Um, so I'll move on to my second point. I don't know how long this is going to go. I appreciate that, you know, Page One always gives, you know, short little lesson. <laughs> he speaks with, uh, you know, contribution or communion. <laughs> It's awesome because, you know, if mine only takes, you know, five minutes, I'm good. You know, we got a full service anyway. And, and then Ed helping out as well, you know, so it's, it's good. We'll, we'll be the, the trio that kind of 
hopefully the three of us all put together uh, give you some some good spiritual feeding uh, today. Uh, my second point is about connection with God. Turn to John 15, 1 through 8. You know, we, we long for perfect connection with those around us. And as we know, it doesn't just happen. Uh, but we also long for perfect connection with God. And that's the same thing. It doesn't just happen. Uh, we're going to look at John here. It says, I'm the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, uh, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. You know, here we see Jesus, and if, if you go on reading uh, John 15, over and over again, Jesus repeats, I'm the vine, you're the branches, you know, obviously an important thing. Um, you know, here he spent, Jesus is spending time with his disciples just before he's about to be sent to the cross to be crucified. And he obviously had some important things that he wants to convey to them before he's gone. Um, you know, up until this time, they heard the parables. They'd been with him, preaching, teaching, um, healing. But he wants to impart some important stuff before he goes. So he spends some of his last precious moments stressing these points. Multiple times we see him describing himself as the vine and his disciples the branches. Let me ask you, when you think of a grapevine, what is the role of the vine? The roles. Number one, the vine supplies roots, which provides nutrients required for life and growth. It supplies a stem or the stalk which is needed for structure and strength. And then you have the branches. What are their roles? Their roles are to grow leaves, which gather light, and to grow fruit. Um, and I'm sure I forgot a few things <laughs> that you probably already figured out and you thought to yourself, boy, he really needs a couple sessions with Sin Sin so that he can, you know, that he's obviously forgotten his plant biology. And, uh, but, you know, this should give us a start for our discussion. <laughs> and besides, Jesus wasn't a plant biologist either that we know. Well, he created the plant. He thought he was a, a, a craftsman. What's that? <laughs> um, so what is he saying? Uh, he's telling us he's the life giver. He has the roots. You know, the, the nutrients go from the roots up through a very specialized set of structures that move the nutrients to where they need to go. Um, he's the life giver of the to the branches. He's one who gives structure and guidance and purpose. He gives life. Uh, he's telling us that we are a part of him. Right? That we are connected and that we need to be connected. 
We were made to be connected. And ultimately, connection is not optional. Um, what happens when a branch gets disconnected? Dies. Nothing. <laughs> nothing happens, right? It bears nothing. It's useless to the vine, right? Um, it no longer has structure or guidance or purpose or nutrition or life, right? Um, every part of the vine, you know, has its perfect purpose. Like I said, we're meant to bear fruit. If we're the branches, that's our role. Um, you know, also being part of the, I'm sorry, I missed something here. No, I didn't, I'm good. Um, part of being a part of the vine means acceptance of everything that comes along with being tended to by the gardener, right? Um, so what's the big deal with all the pruning Jesus is talking about? He talks about the pruning process. And if you understood about being a, a vineyard, caretaker, or vine ter caretaker, or gardener, as Jesus describes God, you know that pruning is an essential part of growing healthy grapes. Now, since we live in, you know, grape country here, uh, and wine country, which I love, <laughs> I love being where we're at, um, I did a little reading about grapevine pruning. Yeah, right? Always good to learn something. Uh, made me dig a little bit. So I actually went, you know, the uh, Washington State University does a lot of research and studying and viticulture. That would be wine making and grape growing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I found out a couple of trivial facts here. Maybe you don't care, but hopefully this helps illustrate part of uh, what we're talking about. Um, <coughs> did you know grapes bear fruit on the green shoots that arise from one-year-old canes? Very specific, that one-year-old. The canes that produce fruit this season will not produce again. All right? Some shoot thinning is required to take out unproductive shoots with no fruit clusters or those that are too closely spaced. Each grape shoot needs 14 to 16 well-exposed leaves <laughs> to properly ripen a grape cluster. If too many shoots are crowded together, leaves don't get enough light and it won't give it effective photosynthesis right in fact shaded leaves only function at about six percent of their capacity and might not contribute anything at all to grape cluster ripening hmm. unless clusters are very small it's usually best to thin down to one cluster per shoot. Especially if there are three or four clusters. Uh, this helps, um, sorry, just before harvest, the lower leaves surrounding the grapes should be removed to provide better sunlight, a better sun exposure because it helps to ripen the grapes and to pre prevent disease uh, infection. So what do I bring all this up? Right? This is all just to say that, you know what? It's not just good enough to be part of the vine. 
right? God knows this, right? If it takes all this work to bear fruit, shouldn't we be pruned, mm-hmm. right? If that's our job, um, you know, we need to be willing to accept being pruned. Um, now, if you think about the process of pruning, it requires some cutting. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, it requires some training. You know, that also talks about how to train the canes so that they go the right direction and then you don't get too much crowding again. Um, it requires effort. Now, all of this isn't always so pleasant, is it? For example, the image of being cut or trimmed sounds pretty painful. Um, training is often painful and time-consuming, right? Effort isn't always something we feel like giving, right? Uh, however, in order for us to be effectively... Uh, sorry. In, in order for us to effectively stay connected to the vine, um, we need to be willing and at times even yearn to have these things happen in our lives. Right? Um, remember that Jesus urged us to stay connected with him as he is with us. He also reminds us that without him, we're not a, we're able to do nothing. Um, have you ever felt in your spiritual life it was kind of at a standstill? I know I have. It's not a not a great place to be, if we're honest. Um, this connection with God leaves me feeling lonely. It leaves me feeling insecure, mm-hmm. and it leaves me feeling unconfident yeah. in who I am. Uh, but being our creator, God knows this. And that's why it says in verse 6, If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. So I need to be really cautious that I'm not allowing myself to wither spiritually. Uh, You'll notice that here, the ability for a branch to stay in the vine, it's a decision, right? (coughs) You see, it's always a person's choice of whether or not they want to hang around to be fed and nourished by God. He won't force you to do anything. He won't beg you. But he does supply us with what we need. Right? Uh, It's for that very reason that he gave us his spirit. To connect with us so that he can direct us and guide us and instruct us. So, like I said earlier, some of us stink at connection. I happen to be one of those unfortunate souls. So I hope that these thoughts have inspired you to consider how you're connecting. I know it certainly challenged me. Thank you. Am I still up here? (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> can't catch a break. <laughs>